one. Well, hey, Dave Melinda here, Positive Polarity Podcast. Hope things are going awesome for you. As you know, each week I try to find an awesome person. And this question was like, I thought was going to be super easy. And then it turned out to be not super easy. So I'm going to present this to you. And then I'm going to, you're going to have like an immediate reaction. And I'm guessing it's not going to be the end result that we end up talking about. So the question is, what is your company's superpower? You know, and when I was preparing, I'm thinking, well, is it a product? Is it a service? Maybe it's a sales process. Maybe it's our brand. Maybe it's our marketing position. And all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, talking to this person, I'm like, none of those are really hitting the mark. And her answer is, could your people be your superpower? And I was like, oh my gosh, that's really intriguing. So I wanted to get her on the show. So I'm honored to be hanging out with Cynthia Matheny. How are you today? I am jingly. How are you doing, Dave? I'm well. Yes, I heard that you might have a couple jingles on. We're taping this around Christmas. So thank you for jumping on. Um, you are in charge over there. I'm hoping because your name's on the door. So it's Cynthia, Cynthia Matheny Coaching and Consulting. So yep. first of all, fill in the world on what is going on over by you guys. So I'm located in Boise, Idaho. And, you know, getting ready for Christmas. It's almost Christmas time. I'm not sure when the listeners will be hearing this, but uh, Idaho is one of my favorite places on earth. We have the great outdoors, lots of mountains, and I'm an adventure girl, so I love living here. Awesome. What kind of coaching and consulting are you focused on these days? Leadership coaching. And okay. I say my love language is DISC, the four behavioral styles. And so pretty much everything I do, the majority of my training is very specifically DISC focused. And okay. a lot of my leadership coaching, of course, is filtered through the lens of DISC because it's so relevant in, I mean, really every aspect of business. Yeah, absolutely. And we obviously share that uh, passion. So that's why I'm going to be super, super excited. I'm already excited to jump into this. And, and I want to kind of go back to the question. I mean, I'm assuming that when you pose that question to your clients, do you get a lot of those, you know, answers that I came up with, you know, my superpowers, my product or my superpowers, this or that? Do people generally think in terms of my team being my superpower? Do you get that much? Oh, I, I get a lot of what you get as well. I think people tend to overlook the fact, overlook the fact that one of their most valuable resources is their people. And that can really make a business or break a business, depending on how you lead them and depending on how they present themselves or lead others within the organization. Yeah, that's really true. And when I wrote Growing on Purpose, we talked about strengthening the team as part of the book. And it was crazy because a weak team will provide a weak customer experience and a strong team will provide a strong customer experience. So that to me was really powerful to understand that my team has so much more to do with my company's outcome than I really ever thought before. Is that yeah. kind of a blind spot that you're seeing uh, some entrepreneurs, they, are they making that connection or are they still having a hard time making that connection, Cynthia? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of my clients come to me through the lens of already having done some personal growth and development. So a lot of my specific coaching clients and a lot of people that I do training for um, are less impacted by that and they they have an appreciation. Um, it's one of the reasons why they hired me, either to come in and do a team building workshop or a sales workshop or, or in the coaching realm. So I personally don't see that. I think that, um, that there's a lot of that out there. Organizations who just haven't been exposed to the same type of training, for example, that you and I have been exposed to. Sure. Well, and I think that's a, a lot of entrepreneurs. I don't know about your experience, but my experience early in my career before I was familiar with DISC. I, as an entrepreneur, was secretly wishing that I could build a team that was just like Dave. If we could have 10 or 20 
or a hundred Daves on this team, man, this team would be awesome. That was my exploded view of myself, right? And right. then I realized, well, like, and you're probably in the same scenario because our personalities are very similar. If yep. we had a bunch of Cynthia's and Dave's on the team, man, we'd have post-it notes, we'd have ideas, we'd have just these greatest brainstorming sessions ever, right? But yep. then when it came to implementation, you and I would look at each other and be like, all right, who's going to implement all these ideas? Exactly. Right? Yeah, so, we'd have a lot of fun, but not much would get done. Exactly. So do you see a lot of that where people still are secretly and maybe even outwardly saying, Cynthia, I want a bunch of me on the on my team? Are, are you still seeing that a lot in, in today's business? I don't, actually. I think what the majority of the people that I work with have heard about this and have okay. some sort of an idea and are looking for guidance and the information that I can provide based on Oh, what does our team look like from a disk structured standpoint for, based on our individual um, profession? Is sure. it well-rounded? Because not every prof not every profession um, group disk wheel is going to look the same or should look the same. It's going to be very sure. varied. So the majority of my people are really looking to me for um, guidance and information on what can we do to be stronger and where are our gaps. That's awesome. I tell you, if you're not familiar with DISC, it's a great assessment tool to be able to do a deep dive on your team. So why don't you, Cynthia, just for the people that may not be uh, familiar with it, kind of walk us through what those four letters mean and kind of what, what those are entailed, just so that people can get a better understanding of, of what we're talking about today. Yeah, perfect. So DISC is comprised of four quadrants of behavior, and there's usually colors associated with the four quadrants. And you could look maybe different places online, and some organizations may use different words, different colors, but the majority um, are known by D for dominance, which is typically a red color, I for influence, which is commonly yellow, F for steadiness, which is often green, and then C for compliance, which is often blue. And, you know, we're made up of all four of those behavioral styles just in varying degrees. And so when I'm teaching people on the concepts, I ask them to focus on which two of the four do you most identify with? Because most oftentimes people more strongly resonate with two of those four. And then it can tell you a lot about yourself and then it can better help you understand other people and predict their tendencies. And that in and of itself is a recipe for stronger connections and stronger relationships. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I think that, you know, for everybody listening, if you're a business owner, your team, they really look for that connection. I mean, whether it's in a sales organization, it's an office, whatever you do, you know, people generally tend to find want to find people like them. And and I know, yeah. like I said, I was excited for today because you and I, our assessments are almost identical. And so we could sit for hours and chat and not really, you know, uh, miss a beat. Whereas yeah. there's plenty of people that have a different, um, you know, personality profile than us. Are there some better than others? Or how do you help people understand you know, this is maybe because a lot of times I'm guessing some people think, I wish I wasn't like that. My company yeah. doesn't want to be that way. I'm not as good as you. How do you help people with that, um, with those understandings? Yeah, I love that question. And that's one thing that I'm super passionate about sharing with people is that there's not a right or a wrong style. Like style is neutral. The meaning that we assign it, we can assign it a right or a wrong or a positive or a negative, but the reality is we need all four quadrants of behavior in varying times and places in order to function at the highest and best. So when we think about a team atmosphere, depending on, depending on the organization within the team, there are oftentimes behavioral styles that are better suited for different positions, depending on the job title or the job tasks that that role has, right. um, which makes perfect sense, which is why a lot of people use the DISC assessment as a piece of the hiring process. It should never be used as a complete deal breaker. Um, 
but as a piece of the hiring process, because I like to say the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And so the way I typically show up is relatively fast paced and I like to move from one thing to the next. So if I were to interview for a position that was extremely slow paced and needed me to slow down and analyze data all day long without interacting with people, I could do that, but I probably wouldn't do it very well and I probably wouldn't enjoy it because it doesn't really fit with the way I'm naturally wired. So more than looking at which style is right or wrong, it's more of a what type of employment would my style be best suited for? And even with that, it is not your behavioral style doesn't dictate your success. You can be a highly successful salesperson and have more of the FD behavioral style. You are probably going to achieve that success a little bit differently than someone who leads with their D and their I. Well, and it's funny because, like I said before, uh, whatever flavor, color, word, whatever you want, whatever letter, if a if a if a entrepreneur business owner is one or two primary, which generally they are. If you're not trained to think outside your box, you're going to be really, again, challenged because, you know, I know for me, if I'm always, like I said, I'm looking for people like me. And I had to learn that the hard way that while you don't like for me, if I was in an accounting department, you know, in, in this situation, Cynthia, I would be so out of my comfort zone. I don't like yeah. numbers. I don't like spreadsheets. If I can round to the nearest thousand dollars, that's fine, right? Yeah. But I tell you what, that doesn't work in most accounting departments. And exactly. You know, and and now I feel like less of a person, or I don't feel right. I, you know, there I can see how this can become emotional pretty quick, and and so it's helpful. Do do people generally know that about themselves, or is this something that just really helps them understand themselves better? So it's been my personal experience and my experience throughout my time, 13 years of coaching and training people, that until they're exposed to the fact that not everybody is wired the same way, not everybody thinks, acts, or responds the same way you do. And I remember exactly where I was in the building in my office back in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was like, no, like, of course, this client is responding this way. They don't think like I do. And so once you understand that, what that does for me, first of all, it allows me to know what to expect from myself, right? Like I'm going to going to act like this in all areas. And it also allows me to predict the tendencies in other people so I can realign my expectations of those people who are wired differently than me, which reduces frustration. And then you go one step further and realize, okay, so they're wired differently than me. If I want a strong connection, and if I want them to like me and trust me, then maybe I need to interact with them a little bit differently. Maybe I need to lead them different, sell to them differently, present to them, I mean, raise them differently. Um, that's where the magic really happens. And I think, you know what, you hit on something that I want to make sure we hear, because you said realign your expectations. And let's be real here for a minute, because it's just you and me, okay? We tend to want to have other people realign their expectations, right? Right. I'm not going to be the one to change. I'm the damn business owner, right? So you guys all around me better just learn to speak my language. I think of it as like different languages where, you know, a D person speaks Italian, let's say, and then the I person speaks French okay they generally if they don't understand each other's language they're not going to have a successful connection so exactly. my question is Cynthia, Cynthia is, is it hard to get people to realign their expectations because hey I own this place man <laughs> you know is that yes. do you see that as a as a common struggle yeah, so it's it's interesting because I think we have to go one step deeper and ask, like, what are you looking for? Like, as an entrepreneur, as an owner of an organization, what is the outcome you want to achieve? Do you want to increase your sales? Okay, great. So that would make sense if it was a sales business. And so then we scale it back and we look at, and what would have to happen in order for you to increase sales? And that goes all the way back down to your people. So if your goal 
is to have higher sales, then one of the things that your people are going to need to know how to do is connect better with other people. If you want to be an effective leader for those people and your goal is to increase sales through being a better leader for your people, that's where we have to realize that it's first that the ownership comes from us. And yeah, do you have to change? No. Nobody has to change. Nobody has to adapt. First of all, I don't want you to change who you are. All I ask of people is to simply identify when it's necessary to adapt your behavior. The reason we have a desire to adapt is create that stronger connection. So as a leader, if you're not interested in modifying and adapting the way you interact with others, you're probably not going to see a great result. So again, in my business, people are reaching out to me to help them grow. So those business owners and entrepreneurs generally are abundance mindset focused and are open to understanding. And the majority of them, especially the higher Ds, are like, oh, I'm part of the problem here. And those are the people that I can best help. Those that are willing to say, I need to take some ownership in this as well. Sure. And you're talking to people that may not be even at that spot yet, right? Somewhere on, on this, there's somebody listening right now that this is like news to them. This is, you know, all brand new. So I think of it like a chameleon, you know, yeah. I mean, a chameleon is naturally whatever color, um, you know, for you and I, we're red and yellow, right? So we're naturally red, naturally yellow. So if I have to talk to somebody that's green or blue, Again, back to what I said before, my expectation naturally, if I didn't know disc was to be like, well, you start turning my color, right? And that's where I think the friction comes in. That's where poor leadership comes in, you know, and so many people are leaving companies now, Cynthia, because of poor leadership. So yeah, we've invested yeah, all this money to get them on the team. And now we don't treat them the way they want to be treated. So I try to tell people simply just think of it as a chameleon. If you're talking to somebody that's blue, turn blue. And I love what right. you said. As soon as you're done, we can go back to our normal color, right? I mean, the company's not saying you need to live blue. Yeah, you just need exactly. to do when you're talking to somebody that's blue. So is, is the chameleon yes. thing an accurate kind of assessment in your world? Yeah, I would completely agree with you with, um, in that regard. I call it adapting. Um, and it's identifying, first it's understanding the four different quadrants of behavior and being educated enough to have an understanding of how could I identify or best identify, and sometimes that's through process of elimination, like the type of person that I'm dealing with, how are they naturally wired? Because that's step number one in adapting. And once we have done the best we can to identify the style of the other person, then we can compare that to the way we are naturally wired and ask, okay, do I need to adapt the way I communicate with this person or, or are we similar enough? Like for you and I, like you mentioned, Dave, there's no adaptation necessary for you and I to connect well. And yet if I am wanting to connect with a blue and a yellow behavioral style, then I'm gonna know, yeah, I need to show up differently. And we are the ones that are responsible. The people who have been exposed to the information are the responsible party in stepping up to the plate and making that adaptation because you can't expect something of someone that they're not aware of. Yeah, great. Now a bunch of people are going to jump off, Cynthia. So <laughs> stay with us, okay? We're going to get, it's going to get better because I just know for like when I first started uh, understanding this, it was very overwhelming. And so it for somebody, be. yeah, for somebody listening, how can we, is there some steps that you can simplify this? Is there an easy way for somebody to be able to tell? Let's just take either your best customer, a, a good vendor that you have, maybe a spouse or another family member. Is there a way for us, Cynthia, to look at them and to understand who they are or start with me? I'm I'm new to this. If someone's listening and they're new, how do I know which one I fit into? Is there an easy way to identify that? That's a great question, which is why I created the company that I did, because my passion is educating people around what are these four colors? What do they mean? And how can I use that to benefit? I mean, me personally, 
I hired a coach. I was in sales. I was introduced to DISC through real estate. And okay. I happened to hire a coach who used the DISC at a very high level to teach me how to better interact and communicate with my team and then my clients and also with my kids. And it literally changed my business and it changed my life. So getting yourself in a position where you can expose yourself to learning more about it, there are lots of ways you can do that online. You can reach out to Dave, you can reach out to me, but it's really learning what are the typical characteristics that we're looking for in these four different behavioral styles. And that's the majority of what I do is teach people how to understand what those four styles are and then what we are looking for in other people. Okay. And I think about it like I always think of these four people standing at an elevator and try to really like look at some behaviors that they do. And, you know, uh, we're going to unpack that in a minute. But I want to go back to one thing that you said about increasing sales, because I'm sure there are a bunch of people that were like they got their ears perked up. Hopefully all entrepreneurs have a desire to increase sales, right? And I think that like um, certain business owners, Cynthia would say, just make more calls, just do more, do more, do it faster, right? Just go out there and get more. But, and that's a certain personality and neither one of these is right or wrong. It's just different. And then there's people that are like, why don't we sell more to our existing customers or why don't we offer a better experience? You know, so there's even when you're thinking about increasing sales, there's different ways to look at it based on personalities. Do you see that in in your world when you're working with salespeople that there's really different ways to achieve that same increased sales as a goal? Absolutely. In sales is a numbers thing, right? And it's also a people business. And yeah. so my philosophy is why not do both? Why don't we talk to more people? And before we go out, and talk to more people, why don't we learn how we can best connect with those people? And that's what I teach when I when I talk about the sales aspect of it. Because even if it's people that we already know, they might not be in a position to do business with us. Maybe they don't know us well enough. Maybe they don't quite trust us yet. Different behavioral styles have different levels of natural trust with other people. And sure. so again, at the core, people will do business that they connect with and that they like and, like and that they trust. So in order to connect with someone, you have to speak their language in a way that makes them feel connected to you. Once you get that connection, then that tends to build trust. And so, yes, we can go make 100 cold calls, and yet if we don't have the foundational skills to understand how to best connect with those people, then we're leaving money on the table. Or we could only work with people that we currently know, and we're going to have a limited number of people in our sphere of influence or in our database, and that's only going to get us so far. So I like to teach combining both of those and then add to that, I'm looking for the people who are looking for me because I can't sell something to someone who doesn't want or need that I have. I just have to know how to ask the right questions and how to connect with them to discover, are these one of the people I can help? And there's a word that keeps coming back and it's connect and connection. And it's so crazy that this has been overlooked for so long, whether on the team, connecting with your customer, wherever. I mean, we obviously think of connecting at home um, as probably a little bit more natural, but to, to connect at work almost can seem a little um, like an oxymoron, right? You're here to do a job you're a number, you know, you have a, a pile of tasks to do, get them done. But yet there's, without that connection, you know, people don't get engaged. And without engagement in our team, boy, it's the likelihood of success is so, so, so little. So I'm assuming exactly. connection is kind of the same for you. I mean, we, we'd we like to be more connected on, at work. We then become more connected in life in general. Is that, are you on, in agreement with that? Yeah, I think it kind of comes back to what we started with, with people being your superpower. Can you have an organization where there is not a high degree of connection and people are there to clock in, clock out, and do a job? Can they accomplish that? Yes, they can. 
When they get to accomplish it at the higher, highest level, functioning that way, they're not. They're just not. So adding this of connection in there, I think, that can really take people to another level. And that's what a lot of times I've hired because people feel stagnant. They want to go. They want to grow beyond reach their feeling of achievement. And oftentimes it's that understanding of, again, leadership, communication, sales, and providing an experience based on how your client is naturally wired, which is really going to create an overall better experience. And who doesn't want to repeat that or refer people to have that same level of experience? Yeah, that's so cool. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I really want to kind of go through these D-I-S and C for people that aren't familiar with it. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Awesome. This is so cool. I think the other cool thing, which is this is transcend work like you've been alluding to, right? This you can bring home. Uh, you know, this is pretty much anywhere. We're also consumers. So we're looking for that connection with our sales professionals when we're out in the marketplace. So how do you tell somebody, let's start with a D, the dominance piece. Um, if somebody's listening right now and they're like, boy, I don't know which one I am. Are there some words that you would interchange with the dominance thing for somebody to maybe okay. understand like that? Yeah, so first of all, the word dominance can be off-putting to some people because some yep. people associate a negative connotation. And so I like to just dispel that right away. And so we'll just set dominance aside. So the higher D behavioral styles, these are people who tend to be faster paced. They tend to be more direct. They tend to be quite decisive. They don't need as much information before making bigger decisions. They tend to be more likely to take risks. They are the visionary people who can see how these big visions are not necessarily people, as you mentioned earlier, to carry out all of the things in a systematic way need to be done. So these are the, these are the go-getters. Their feelings don't get hurt as easily. Um, and so they tend to take rejection a little bit better. They tend to be more competitive both with themselves and other people, which is why this behavioral style oftentimes will show uh, show up in highly successful salespeople because they need to be go-getters in order to achieve in sales. Not always, oftentimes that would be the higher D. Sure. So like you think, so fast, direct, risk, visionary, competitive, either those words right now for the listener are like, they're like fingers on a chalkboard because they're like, oh, I don't want that. That's probably not you then, right? Or mm -hmm. you're like, yeah, those are awesome words. I really like those, you know? I mean, just your reaction to those are probably going to start to give you an indication of where you are. And yeah. I know like for competitive, I'm super high competitive. Everything in my world is like, I, is a winner and a loser, right? And, and it's so odd because when I play games with my family, we're, if we're on a cruise and we're just playing a game, I'm there for one purpose, and that's to win. Yep. I mean, that's just all it is, right? And they're there to have fun. They're not paying attention. And I'm like, hey, we got to get this game going, right? And it's just funny. It, even in that type of setting, it's yep. so obvious when you see that. Do people tend to struggle to adapt? Um, um, label themselves I'll say or do they kind of sit with it and go yeah that's me and they own it do, do they have a hard time finding themselves in some of these what I encourage people to do is be open and vulnerable with yourself okay. not assign a negative or a positive connotation with any of the descriptors just sure. look at it as more neutral and then as I go about my teaching I like to talk to them about how extreme you are in any of these behaviors, because any of these behaviors, any of them that we talk about to the extreme can be what I call unhealthy in a way that it probably is not going to help us in that extreme moment to get move closer to our goals. So I find that if people are open to learning, then they tend to be more open to being non-judgmental. And I and oftentimes started training with that. Like this is a no-judgment zone, especially of ourselves, because we tend to be our worst critics. Sure. So that extreme competitiveness that I just told you about. 
It's probably, I mean, I know it's not healthy because it does, you know, it does hinder my relationships at time because I said that the competitive comes ahead of the relationship. And, you know, in our family, we ask the question, do you want to be right or do you want to be loved? And it's like, oh my gosh, I want to be right. You know, forget this love stuff. But because yeah. of the fact that I have that high I, which kind of, you know, leads me into the next one. What are some words there that you would interchange with that I for people that might be listening? Yeah, so for the influencers, these are the people, they tend to be very people oriented. They get okay. their energy from spending time and interacting with people. They tend to be more optimistic when they're looking at the lens of life through the glass is half full versus the glass is half empty. They enjoy collaborating with other people, um, communicating with other people. They can oftentimes get super excited about something new. They like to have fun. They oftentimes can be witty. I joke and say that's not part of my high eye. I tend to be um, not as quick-witted as some of the other high eyes. But we like to have fun and we like to do a variety of things and we can get bored easily doing the same thing the same way over and over again. Yeah. And there is, again, I think a great example, Cynthia, of a team. So think about a ID, we're going to call it a, a, a fast, direct, results-oriented person. They're on that team. And then there's this I person, this collaborator, optimistic, like the interaction. I mean, there's an immediate recipe right there for disaster. If those two okay. people aren't aware of each other, right? What are some things that happen with those two right off the bat if they don't understand each other? So the high D will get super impatient with the high I. They are likely to get frustrated with them because the high I is likely going to be interrupting them, asking them questions, wanting to, you know, talk about their day. And yeah. so right up front, then the higher D may be perceived by the higher I as being uncaring or unkind because they don't give me the time of day. Yeah. And it really has nothing to do with the other person. And so I encourage people to look at both of those and then just have honest conversations and say, you know, it's really important to me that I have higher degree of interaction. Uh, that would be the high I maybe saying that to the high D and the high D might respond with what's well, really important for me to make sure that I accomplish all my tasks in one day. So let's set up a specific amount of time where you can get the interaction you need and I have, I know exactly how long that's going to be and can plan around that so I can accomplish the rest of my goals. So it all comes down to communication. Again, so, it's understanding yourself and how you're wired and then understanding other people and then talking about that. I oftentimes call that creating systems to save you from yourself because the way you're naturally wired can really help you accomplish your goals. And it can also hold you back. So that's where it comes into that self-awareness around, am I using this behavior to the extreme where it's actually holding back from accomplishing my goal? And in your case, it may be for if the goal is for your children to feel loved, winning at all costs may not be something that is going to help you move forward in that goal. So it's just looking at, and how do I um, put a system in place to save me from doing something that really is going to keep me from reaching my goals as fast as I want to. No kidding. And I tell you, it's interesting. Part of the assessments that we use, they talk about an ideal environment. And so, you know, I think about that, you know, a, a high D and a high I are talking Monday morning and the high D, you know, um, basically ask the high I, what'd you do this weekend, which probably is a mistake right there because the high I just gives that person, oh my gosh, on Friday night, we did this and Saturday morning, I did this. And this 90 second litany of what got, ha what got accomplished over the weekend. And then the high I says to the high D expecting the similar response, what'd you do this weekend? The high D says nothing. You know, and there's a major disconnect right there because we're expecting to connect at that level. So that's where I think you, like you said, understanding that other group, that's why we spend this time. Because if you have a high D in your world and you're a high I, 
you're going to potentially have some disagreements. You're going to have some things that you're going to have to work through. And it, it eventually probably could cause conflict to the point where some people are like, this isn't worth it. I don't like coming to work. I don't like this person. I don't like the environment that I'm in. So um, thanks for sharing exactly. these. Yeah, as we jump into the S then, so what are some things that a, a typical S person, what would be some words that you would use for that individual? Well, so these are the steady, stable people. They like to keep peace and calm in their environment. They are great helpers. They typically get sheer enjoyment from helping others achieve what they want to achieve. They like to know what to expect. So having a timeline or step-by-step -step processes, they tend to struggle a little bit more with things changing, especially if they don't understand the reasons for change. Um, and one of the ways I like to compare the S and the D, because the S and the D tend to be most opposite of one another, is that there are some people who would rather have a salary position where they know, they know exactly how many hours they're going to work, exactly what their role needs to accomplish and exactly how much money they're going to get at the end of every month when they get paid. The opposite, the D style probably is very um, interested in a 100% commission role where they are the master of their own destiny, that they know that the harder they work, the more they can accomplish. And yes, they might be working 60 hours a week sometimes, but it will be worth it because the payoff in the end, even though they don't, they're not guaranteed that, they're willing to risk take the risk on themselves. And neither is right or wrong. Right. But both of them are very valuable. And so that just is kind of an example as to how the D and the S style tend to think differently about things like that. For sure. And I could see where the D style could take advantage of that S, right? Where that competitive, I got to get this done. And all of a sudden I run into somebody that's a calm, stable, they want to help others. Right. I could see where a high D person, a red competitive person could easily be like, hey, do this, do this, do this. Right. Do you have time to do this? I mean, I could see. And again, if we don't understand that correlation between those, um, that can become a really unhealthy environment, I would guess. Right. Yeah, and it's interesting that you say that because one of the things that I like to teach the people in my training room or that I'm presenting and doing a team building workshop is. Nobody can take advantage of you without your permission. So it's the S style's responsibility to understand, maybe I tend to be a people pleaser. I don't want to let anyone down. So they will put themselves last. You can't be taken advantage of without giving permission yourself, even if it's not verbal permission. And so think about, before you respond, think about how you saying yes to something Will impact what else you have going on because it's the S style's responsibility to have personal boundaries in place to keep from being taken advantage of. Now, the D has a responsibility as well in understanding that that might be their tendency. And so, with those two dynamics specifically, that again is where a high degree of communication needs to come in. So, they're both getting what they need from that relationship. Yeah, and those paces are generally the opposite too, because it's the is like, done right, and the yes. the F is very methodical and slow this pace. Let's slow this down a little bit, right? right. And we're just like yes. slow it down. We got to get this done. Exactly. <laughs> you know? yep. So those are really those are tough, and that's again these are ins and outs daily going on on teams across the world. And without knowing this, at least for me, now that I know it, Cynthia, it's way easier to be able to say that that's how they are built. I always used to think in the sales world when the asses, if I was trying to sell something to an ass and they're like, well, I need to go home and talk to my wife. I need to talk to four other people, whatever, right? I was like, why are you jamming me up like this? Quit, you know, I felt like they were stalling me. It was like a sales, you know, technique. But the reality is it was their personality. And exactly. that's what they needed. And, yes. and once you and figure that out, at least you can work through it a lot better. So that, yeah. that, that's awesome. Um What's the last, so as the C, as we, as we look at the last one, what are some words for that personality that you've seen and, and that you teach? 
Yeah, so the compliance, these are the people that tend to be more analytical. Oftentimes they're analytical with numbers. They might think in numbers. They tend to be more detailed. They want to spend more time researching things to ensure that they're making the right decision. So they'll research, research, research. They want statistics, analytics, and they tend to be more quiet. They tend to be drained of their energy by spending long periods of time interacting with other people. There are oftentimes, unfortunately, our society, our society sometimes labels these people as the introverts. And I have a personal passion to help people better understand the quiet people because my youngest of four kids happens to be the only child of mine that is wired completely opposite of me. And she's more quiet, she's more reserved. She takes a longer time in making decisions. Her pace in which she functions is slower and very meticulous. And sure. understanding that this concepts the way I do has changed the way I raise her. And our relationship is so much stronger because of that. So like you mentioned earlier, it's not just at work. If you are human, if you have a relationship with another human in any setting, these concepts can help you. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I always think of the C person as doing it like ready, aim, fire, right? They have this process. Now, for me, I fire first, right? I don't have time to get ready. I sure don't have time to aim, you know, but they are so meticulous. And I have to be really careful because sometimes I judge that in my mind because I'm yeah. a whole different way. And I'm like, why don't you guys just get to be more like me, right? And that just never works because... They don't say yep. anything. They just are in their mind analyzing what I'm saying. And details yes. aren't my strength. So I'm glad I got to learn that they have a strength that I don't have. And I think that that's so powerful. And I think each yes. one of these has a blind spot, right? Potentially about the uh, one of the other personality types. And I think that's why your work is so powerful because you're helping people with those blind spots. We all have blind spots. And yep. so to really understand that they're not, you know, I used to think that these people, these, the C people that were analyzing everything, I thought they're probably waking up in the morning, driving to work and they're on my team and they're like, okay, how can I jam Dave up today? And I'm just realizing that that's not even close to what they're thinking, right? They're analyzing something, okay. right? But it has nothing to do with me, which again, I don't know why I thought I was so, you know, why I was so important in their life. But um, once we have that piece, as we start to land the plane today, you, phase two is, again, phase one is learning where you fit into that. And then phase two is kind of learning where others fit. Now, yes. I feel like the gold here is the third step is actually finding ways to acclimate your way, like you mentioned before, to their way. So there's usually some pretty good um, um, research in our assessments that kind of help us with that. So is there anything that you share with people to kind of help them better understand the importance of that acclimating to somebody else's way? So do you mean the identifying part of someone else's behavioral style or the part in actually where you are adapting how you are doing something to better connect? The second part, yeah, where you're actually okay. doing that um, the acclimation on your end. It, it, I'm just yes. curious, the importance of that, I think it's overlooked a lot. So I just wanted to hear your feedback on that. Yeah, so we have a very specific routine in which I help people to accomplish that. And I alluded, to, I alluded to it earlier, the first question in any given situation is what is the outcome you want to achieve? So in sales, that could be setting an appointment. It could be getting an agreement or a contract signed. It could be going under contract and closing. Um, in leadership, your, how the outcome you want to achieve could potentially be helping someone be as productive as possible, helping someone be the best team player. But if we don't identify the outcome that you want to achieve first, then the mm -hmm. chances of you achieving that are significantly reduced. So sure. once we identify what is the outcome you want to achieve, step number two is doing the best you can to identify the behavioral style of the person you're interacting with, and then deciding is there adaptation necessary? And if there is, 
take the knowledge and information that you have about the way you are naturally wired and then look at their opposing behavioral style or opposite behavioral style and just ask yourself if they're different than me how can what words can i use differently how can i close the sale with a different script than i would typically use or the strategy you kind of alluded to that with in um, your higher D, like, let's get it done, let's get it done. And if you know that the high S needs affirmation and confirmation from someone else to validate they're making the right decision, then you can come around and change that from sign here to, listen, I know that it's important for you that you make sure that you're making the best decision for everyone involved. So how much time do you think you will need before we can circle back and we can get this finalized? They're going to be like, oh, this isn't a crazy, pushy salesperson. I like this person. I feel connected with them. So it's just in any given situation, looking at it from what are they going to want? How do they want to be spoken to? Do they want to be challenged? Don't know what else would want to be challenged the same way. Yeah. And that's such a fundamental shift. You'd think it would be easy, but it's really a fundamental shift for a sales professional to look at everything through the prospect's eyes or a yes. leader to, through the eyes of the person that they're leading. So I, I love that that's your passion. I think um, it comes down to self-awareness, really, because if we don't have that self-awareness. We're oblivious to all this, and it's all happening around yeah. us, and we don't care. I love the zipper merges on the freeway where it's supposed to be every other car going from three lanes to two. And I tell you what, the oblivious people, they don't even know where they're, they don't even care, right? Yeah. It's, it's just crazy. And so hopefully people listening today will at least take a minute to think about their self-awareness and think about their team or the people that they communicate on a daily basis to be able to really think this through. Because you can ram your way through, which may work, but I tell you, I've seen it way more successful when you're aware of the people that are around you. So I'm assuming Absolutely. we're in in, in, uh, in on the same page with that. 100%. Yep. That's awesome. Um, one last question. I want to let you go here, Cynthia. What would your tip of the day be for somebody listening? Maybe it's something we covered. Uh, maybe it's just something on your heart that you want to share uh, with, with somebody listening. But I just want to make sure that you are able to share whatever's on your heart as we land the plane today. So what comes to my mind is oftentimes it can be difficult to identify the behavioral style in someone else, especially if you haven't been significantly educated around it. So I'll leave the audience with a tip. Here's a question. I call it the one simple question that you can ask someone that will help identify their behavioral style. And so that question is, how would your spouse or best friend describe you? And then you're gonna give them four options. Give them A, direct and to the point, B, social and outgoing, C, steady and dependable, or C, cautious and perfectly accurate. And their response to that, if you didn't pick that up, the A, those two descriptor words are directly related to the D behavioral style. The two descriptor words, social and outgoing, are directly related to the I. The steady and dependable are directly related to the S. And the cautious and perfectly accurate are related to the C. So they answer, when they answer that question, that will kind of give you the information that you need. And they may even say, well, kind of a combination of A and B. Okay, great. Sure. Now you know how to communicate with them and how not to communicate with them based on that one simple question and the answer that you get. That's so powerful. And I wish that there was a way to ask every prospect that question, right? <laughs> we would have so much more success in our sales journey if we were able to, you know, identify that. And that's really, I think, the power of DISC is being able to, you know, as the more you get acclimated to this, the more you're able to watch mannerisms, you're able to listen yes. to their answers, to their questions, all those mm -hmm. things start to really help. So if this has intrigued somebody, Cynthia, and, you, and they want to reach out directly to you and learn more from you, what's the best way for a, a listener or a viewer to connect with you today? 
And you can go to my website, Cynthia at Cynthia, or no, that's my email. My email, Cynthia at CynthiaMathini.com, or my website is www.CynthiaMathini.com. You connect with me um, through there. I'm always happy to just have conversations with people, maybe direct them to a place where they can learn more. Um, so those are the two best ways to reach out to me. That's so cool. And this proves right here for both of us, the high eye, because we love to have conversations. Like you just yeah. said, I just, we just, she just said, Hey, call me. I'd love to talk to you. Right now, a D you're yeah. not going to get that, you know, a C you're not, you know, it's really, as you start to learn more about this, it's pretty fun to be able to identify that because she would yes. take your call in a heartbeat. She took mine in a heartbeat. And, and that's, what's so cool about it is you're able to understand um, kind of the ground rules of a person and, and where they're at. And I just appreciate all that you're doing in this space, Cynthia, I love to learn from you. And thanks for, for hopefully clarifying this for everybody. Uh, feel free to reach out to her again. She'd love to connect with you. And, um, you know, she most likely is going to be able to help you. And if she said she can't, she'll uh, connect you with somebody that can. So again, thank you so much for this. And just remember as we close that maybe your team is your superpower. And if that's the case, then you got to treat your superpower with the respect and honor that it needs. So thank you for sharing that all today with us. And again, I can't wait to keep learning from you. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate the opportunity to share my passion with people. Awesome.